Okay, well, hello to all my friends in St. Bart's in Toowoomba. Uh, I really wish we were doing this in person on the lovely Sunshine Coast, uh, but I'm, I'm currently on the Sunshine Coast and it is bad, it is wet. Uh, it is so bad, I went past Australia Zoo and the staff were leading animals two by two onto an ark. So uh, it's definitely pretty wet down here on the Sunshine Coast. But I'm grateful for the invitation um, from uh, Adam to be able to spend this time with you on a really great topic, and that is discipleship in Luke and Acts. Now, I don't know whether you know this, I don't know whether you know this, but Luke Acts, you know, the Gospel of Luke and the, the Book of Acts, is the single largest corpus in the New Testament. Okay, so, so think, think about this. Paul's letters comprise 24% of the New Testament. But Luke and Acts together, both written by the same author, Luke, they make up an amazing 28% of the New Testament. I mean, in terms of works by one author, it is the largest block of the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And I think these two books are meant to be written together. In fact, you could say that they are a New Testament in miniature because you get the story of Jesus and the story of the apostles and their ministries. So it's, it's, it's a really great collection. We should always read uh, Luke Acts. It's always good to go back to them. And I, I like Luke Acts because it's really telling a story of a journey that goes effectively from Bethlehem all the way to Rome. And yeah, you know, I, love, I, love I love a good journey story. I don't know, do you like a, do you like a good journey story? Um, some of our favorites, you might know, Lord of the Rings, you know, um, Frodo, his journey to uh, Mount Mordor, you know, and all the, the various travails and things that go wrong in that journey. Uh, some time ago, I saw the movie, the World War I movie, uh, 1917, which is the, the journey of a soldier trying to get an urgent message to the front lines. Uh, and and there's, there's various movies called The Road, you know, which are about various things. And the one I know about is largely the story of a 1950s writer and his life between New York and San Francisco. It's, it's a very famous sort of, you know, 1950s uh, novel. I mean, that's interesting as well. So we all like a good journey narrative. And uh, Luke Acts is, is a kind of journey narrative, like I said, from Bethlehem to Rome. But what is more, there is a very specific journey narrative in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, you can break the Gospel of Luke up into a few different parts. I mean, you've got the infancy narrative, you've got Jesus' uh, Galilean ministry. But then from chapter 9, verses 51, it says, Jesus set his face to go towards Jerusalem. And from that part of chapter 9, all the way through to pretty much the end of chapter 19, you have what is called the travel narrative. And it's in the travel narrative that you get pretty much most of Jesus' teaching about discipleship, what it means to be one of his followers. He talks a lot about wealth and riches. He talks a lot uh, about what is required of disciples. Now, you do get some other discipleship stuff in other parts of the book, like in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. But it's in that travel narrative where you really do get the bulk of Jesus's teaching. And I think Luke records that because he believes that the teachings of Jesus are very important. I mean, he, he wants disciples, people like Theophilus, who he mentions at the beginning, to know the teachings of Jesus. But with that travel narrative, then there's another travel narrative that begins in Acts 1.8. And that's the story of the church's mission. You know, the risen Jesus tells the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that narrative also characterizes the mission of the disciples. You know, how are they going to get to the ends of the earth? And there's a whole bunch of things that go on. There's a whole bunch of ups and downs. Uh, now, I think Luke intends his you know, two volume work then, not just to be informative, like, you know, here's an interesting story of Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, and this is how Paul you know, went to Rome. I think he, wa he wants it not just to be informative, he wants it to be transformative. He wants readers like Theophilus or others or you and me, uh, he wants those to come after him to pay attention to the nature 
and the responsibilities of discipleship. To ask, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What separates a follower from an admirer? How does one enter the kingdom of God? Okay, and you know, what can we learn from Jesus, from other disciples? And what are some of the bad examples we need to be wary about, like Ananias or Simon Magus in the book of Acts? So I'm going to go through a few uh, key themes at the moment that tell us a lot about discipleship in Luke and Acts. The first thing we see is that discipleship requires turning and trusting. Okay, they're the first two things you need in discipleship, turning and trusting. Um, what, what that is to say is Jesus frequently calls people to repentance. Okay, and I mean, what, do, what does repentance mean? Uh, you know, we can define it as being sorry for one's sins, which is kind of true. You know, you expressed regret for your actions when they hurt others and they offend God. But repentance is more than that. It really means to change your mind, okay, to change your verdict. Uh, there's two key points in Luke and Acts that I think really summarize well what repentance means. Uh, the first one comes in Luke 5, where you get the story of Peter's own conversion. Now, this is a bit of material that's unique to Luke's gospel, but, you know, Peter is there and he kind of meets Jesus and Jesus tells him to throw his you know, net on the other side of the boat and they pull on and Peter says, get away from me, Lord, for I am, I am a sinful man. And, and Peter basically you know, has to repent him and he knows he's sinful and he knows he's next to, at you know, the very least, a holy man, a man of God or something like that. Uh, so he has c contrition for his own sense of inadequacies, his own sense of failures, before God, and uh, he is called to follow Jesus. And we then see later on, you know, when Peter has failed, there is also an anticipation that Peter will turn back. You know, when Peter denies Jesus, it's kind of anticipated at the Last Supper that he will turn back and uh, uh, recommence following Jesus. And then when you get into the early church, when you get into Acts uh, 2, uh, Peter, the one who has repented, uh, multiple times, it seems, you know, when he's, he's converted and when he failed Jesus, uh, he now preaches repentance to the people of Jerusalem. They've got to express sorrow, not just for their sins in general, but for what happened to Jesus. And that means they've got to change their verdict on who Jesus is. Uh, he's not a messianic pretender. He's not a false prophet. He's God's Messiah. He is, in fact, the Lord. And you could also argue uh, from the example of Peter, I think, that repentance is not something you just do back then. I think there's a sense in which the Christian life is one of constant repentance, constantly saying sorry for sins, constantly remembering that you know, God is our Father, Christ is our Lord, the Spirit is our Comforter, and turning away from the things of the world, from our own selfishness, our own idolatries we harbor in our heart, and turning back to God. So that's how discipleship begins with turning, but there's another sense of that, and that is we have trusting. And there's so many examples uh, of people who exercise faith in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, you, you could argue that in the various parables, they're really parables about you know, what is the meaning of faith, you know, like the parable of the sower. Sometimes the word falls on rocky ground. Sometimes it falls on soil with thorns and thistles. Sometimes it, it, it lands on good soil and it grows and increases. Uh, by faith, you know, a, a helpless a widow badges a judge saying, give me justice. By faith, one knocks on a neighbor's door asking for some bread. Uh, by faith, one approaches Jesus and asks to follow him. By faith, one awaits the return of the Son of Man. By faith, a tax collector begs for mercy and offers to give away half of his possessions. Uh, according to, to one scholar, uh, Teresa Morgan, she says, for faith, uh, Luke indicates um, 
takes the initiative. Okay, so faith is not just your cognitive assent; it is about trusting. Okay, it, it as Morgan says, it trusts, it endures, it seeks, it asks, it knocks, it lobbies. It's not satisfied until it gets the 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 righteousness or the right relationship with God that it really long for. And I mean, I mean, you can go through Luke and Acts and there's so many good examples of faith. In particular, what I think is very striking, very amazing, is the way that women are key examples of faith. I mean, it's really amazing in the, uh, in the infancy narrative where, where an angel makes an announcement and initially to uh, Zacchaeus and, you know, Zacchaeus is told your mother, you know, not your mother, sorry, your wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a child and Zacchaeus is like really really uh, and as a result of that he becomes silent effectively until the baby is born uh, but then with Mary you know uh, the angel answers to Mary um, you know, despite being unmarried and being a virgin you're going to have a, a baby and how does Mary respond uh, may the Lord's will be done you know may this all be uh, fulfilled you know, she, she responds in faith. She accepts the word at face value. And then you can look at someone like Lydia in Philippi. I mean, there's, there's very examples of people who respond in faith to the words of Jesus or to the message of the gospel. So that's how discipleship begins. It begins with turning, okay? Um, contrition for your sins, changing your mind about Jesus is, and it includes faith, a faith that is active, a faith that seeks after God. Uh, the other thing we notice about faith is it, it requires taking up your cross and paying the price. Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, look at Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 27. This is where Jesus, uh, you know, at one level predicts his you know, forthcoming um, crucifixion. But he adds, adds to that, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. And that word daily is unique to Luke. Must take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, in the ancient world, crucifixion was one of the most awful deaths that could be inflicted on someone. It was reserved for slaves. It was reserved for enemies of the state. It was not something that was to be inflicted on Roman citizens, at least you know, not normally. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a symbol of the zenith of Roman power and cruelty. Okay? And Jesus says, unless you're willing to walk with me effectively to your own crucifixion, unless you're willing to die with me, you can't really join me in the way. I mean, the, these are really hard words because we like what is convenient. We like what is um, uh, therapeutic. You know, we, we like what is luxurious, what, what, is, what, is, what is easy. We like the, you know, the, the road of least resistance. But what Jesus calls us to is not the road of least resistance. It's the road to Golgotha. He bids us to come and die with him. But what he's asking us to die to are the things that separate us from God. He's asking us to die to the, to the idolatries in our life, to the sin that entangles, the things that hold us back, the things that keep us from God, the things that keep us from being uh, the, the, the human beings that God wants us to be, the things that draw us away from Christ and towards the things of the world, the flesh, the devil. That's what we've got to do. We've got to die to the world. I mean, Paul says something similar in Galatians. He talks about being crucified to the world. I think that's the exact same se sentiment. Following Jesus, taking up your own cross, means being crucified to the world. Now, you can see this in practice when you get to Luke 9, uh, 57 to 62. Uh, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, I'll say more about this later, but this is a story of three disciples uh, who are either called or they approach Jesus. And Jesus tells them with what the price of following, his, uh, following him is. And they're all like, yeah, on second thoughts, maybe no. Like one guy says, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, yeah, but are you willing to be homeless? Because, you know, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. 
Another one says, hey, look, I'll follow you. I just got to wait for my dad to die, you know, something like that. Or, hey, look, I'll follow you. I just got to sort some family matters out. I mean, everyone's got this thing, I'll follow you if, but when, or some conditions on their own terms. But in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, the only condition is following the call of Christ himself. Or you get to Acts 14, 22, and Paul can warn that, you know, through many struggles, we must enter the kingdom of God. In, in other words, um, you know, being a disciple, it's not a water slide. It's not, it's not a, a nice, fun, smooth trip. It's more like tracking on the Kokoda Trail. Uh, it's hard. It, it's difficult. But we could say at the end of that trail, there is the kingdom of God. So we've seen so far, discipleship begins with repentance and believing. It requires taking up your cross, you know, reorientating your life towards Christ, dying to the things of the world, living for God, being orientated towards the kingdom of God. And then we also see some of the main marks of a disciple. And if there are two marks of a disciple, they are, it is love and it is being a learner. So uh, if you've got your Bibles there, look, look at Luke chapter 10. Let's look at verses 25 to, I think it's 27, Luke 25, sorry, Luke 10, 25 to 27. Why am I looking at the right, am I looking at the right passage there? Ah, yes, this, this is where, yeah, so this is the 37, Luke 10, 25 to 37. Um, this is about, you know, the nature of love. Uh, 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 an expert in the law, a scribe, asked Jesus, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, he asked him, you know, well, what is written in law? How do you read? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty simple. That's straight out of Leviticus 19.18. Uh, that, that's really good. So, you know, love of God, love of neighbor, um, what my friend Scott McKnight calls the Jesus creed. I mean, that's simple, you know. Love really is one of the top things for discipleship. Loving God, loving the people around you, loving your church, loving your pastor, uh, loving the youth, loving the elderly, uh, you know, the people, yeah, love. Love is how you tell if someone's a Christian. Uh, it's, it's not good enough to have all the right doctrines, to have all the right knowledge, to, be, to recite the creed and yet, if you don't show love to others, and this is a love in action, of which the best example Jesus gives is the famous story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, um, Loving others, being kind to others with no thought of giving back, and even when it may even cost you something. Being kind and loving to others when you have no reason to, and where the prejudices of people around you would say it's not normal to be kind to those sorts of peoples. So love is one of the marks of true discipleship. Love for God, love for your neighbor. Uh, in addition to that, you've also got, I think, being a learner. If we flick back to Luke chapter 6 on the uh, Sermon on the Plain, where you know, Jesus is, is giving his own summary of his uh, teaching. If you go to verses 47 to 49, or I should say 46 to 49, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Okay. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundations on the rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, many of you will, will know of that parable or, the, or those words about the wise and the foolish builders or maybe Matthew's version about the house on the sand. But, you know, Jesus's words, they're not advice. They're not polite suggestions. Uh, Jesus doesn't give his, his teaching to you, his, his warnings, his exhortations with the, with the caveat, you know, if it pleases your highness to consider this. No, he, he says, this is how you are to live. This is how to be the people of God. This is how to be a human being. So, I mean, you've got to learn from Jesus himself. You know, you've got to follow the example of Christ and adhere to the words of Christ. 
uh, in, in this very week gone by, we've been at a, uh, a synod of the Anglican Church where we're talking a lot about definitions of marriage. And we focus a lot on Jesus' own definition of marriage. And, you know, a man will leave his father and be united to his wife. And uh, there, were, there were some people there who said, yeah, well, Jesus only said it once. So does, is, is it really that authoritative? He, he only said it once. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times said it. Jesus said it, so we have to do it. Okay? Now, we have to discern what it means in our own context. I mean, th th that is another exercise. But, you know, Jesus' words for us are not negotiable. We can't just put them in the two hard baskets. Uh, he gives us strenuous commands for our own good, and we have to follow them. So being a disciple requires uh, love. It means being a learner, which is why in the early church, the disciples dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles. And you see that in the end of Acts chapter 2. So there we are, two main marks of disciple, love and being a learner. But if we want to add a final, a final category of something that is also true of a disciple, and that is being missional. Okay, we are meant to be missional. Now, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the really cool, sexy words these days. I mean, you've got to you've got to be missional. Okay, we're going to we're going to be a missional church. We're going to plant missional church. We want missional leaders, missional disciples. I mean, it's a really good buzzword. But what does that mean? What does it mean? to be a missional disciple? Does it mean you're kind of, you know, hanging out tracks for every person you meet or, you know, wearing your what would Jesus do bracelet? I mean, there's all sorts of cheesy things you can do. Uh, I think it means to participate in the mission of Jesus himself. Now, obviously, you are not Jesus. Pretty clear, I'm guessing. But what we've got to do is realize that Jesus had his own mission to, you know, bring in the kingdom of God, to die for our sins. Uh, to proclaim the gospel of God. I mean, uh, one place where I think this is very important is Luke 4. Luke 4, 16 to 18. This is often called the Nazareth Manifesto. And when you, you see there that Jesus says, from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon, is upon him to preach, you know, good news to the poor, freedom to the captives. And he does all this stuff in the power of the Spirit. I mean, he is the one who is proclaiming the good news. He, he sees himself as a light to the Gentiles. But then when you get into the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas use that same language to themselves. When you get to Acts 13, 47, you can see Paul and Barnabas believe their mission to the Gentiles is to be a light to the nations. Now, that's the same language that's been used to describe Jesus by Simeon. That's the same book of the Old Testament that Jesus uses to describe his own mission. It's now being applied to the disciples. OK, so we in our own way, in our own context, we continue the mission of Jesus when we proclaim the good news, when we lift up the brokenhearted, when we set the captive free, when we do the things that Jesus did, when we bring the same message, albeit more focused on Jesus, the one who, who died and rose, then we are being missional disciples. So missional is a great buzzword, but we've got to remember it's filled with very specific content. Content, I think we get from Jesus himself and the actions and the preaching of the apostles. Okay, so let me, let, let me sum up what we've seen in this first session. We've, we've noticed that Luke Acts has this incredible journey from Bethlehem all the way to Rome. We've seen how the journey begins. It begins with, with turning and trusting, that is repentance and faith. And that requires us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. You know, follow him on the way to to Jerusalem or to the, to the heavenly Jerusalem, putting aside the sin that so easily entangles, being crucified to the world, bearing the shame of Christ, paying the cost. Disciples have the marks of love, love for God, love for neighbor, and we're meant to be lifelong learners, heeding to the words of Jesus, keeping the example of Jesus, and paying attention, deep attention to the teaching of the apostles. And we're missional as well. OK, we believe that God works through his people. That's how his grace is manifested in this world. The spirit gives us unction, power, 
We're filled with the Spirit for the purpose of continuing the mission of Jesus. We too are meant to be a light to the nations. The question is uh, how each of us are going to be committed to this. Now, you know, we, we've all got, <laughs> you've got responsibilities. You know, I'm assuming you've, you've got a job, you've got a family, maybe you've got parents you've got to look after. Uh, not everyone can uh, abandon what they're doing and you know, become a missionary in South Africa or anything. And not, everyone, not everyone's called to do that. Not everyone is called to be uh, an evangelist or a pastor or a, a priest or everything like that. But what we are all called to do is to be faithful, to be active in our context, to be a lover of God and a lover of our neighbor, to be a learner, to participate in that mission with the giftings that you have been given. That's what we're meant to do. Uh, and the other thing we're meant to do is to be willing to pay the price for that. And I think that's one of the big things. You know, it's easy to follow Jesus when it costs you nothing. And I think the biggest indictment of, you know, the world I look around today in the state of the church is people are committed to following Jesus to the point of convenience, not to the point that it costs them anything. I'll follow Jesus because, well, he enables me to have some sort of assurance or some sort of hope in this. But it's, it's not transactional. It's not just because, well, God does this, therefore I'll do that. It's, it's love for God. It's the love for neighbor. It's the, it's the belief that the world has been newborn and we want to participate in that. Okay? There's a difference in being, in between being a follower and being a fan. We should not be committed to the point of convenience, but the point we're willing to take up our own cross and follow Christ. And that, I think, is a great way to end the first session.